that, that's, you know, a lot of these things have happened, and it, it seems like, um, culturally speaking, that was almost like the straw that broke the camel's back with a right. lot of the, the things that have happened. So could, could you speak to that, whether it's five minutes or whether it's three minutes or whether it's yeah. 30 seconds? But, but I, I, I think it would be very helpful for us to hear your thoughts on what happened with that. Yeah, well, I think that what happened to George Floyd is pretty much was pretty much universally panned as horrific, to say the least. I don't know too many people. I may have run across one person that tried to justify what took place. But amongst my law enforcement officers, my officer friends, my civilian friends, and average citizens, everybody, I'm all about evidence. I always talk about waiting to get all the facts before you jump to a conclusion. But for me, especially being a firearms and defensive tactics instructor, I didn't need to see anything else. What uh, Chauvin did, that was, that was horrific. Now I know there are other factors that are involved, the medical conditions, the issues he had that were, that were related to his death. But the idea of putting, putting your knee on someone's neck for nine minutes, almost nine minutes, was utterly insane. And I recall crying out to the camera, like, get off him. And I know it was, it was a day late, but I literally yelled out to the camera, like, what are you doing, man? Because it was just a ignorant and stupid and foolish tactic event. And I, it, I know there were so many things that were involved in it. Because as, as information came more clear, you had uh, you hear other officers say that they were telling him to get off of him, but he wouldn't. And I, I really struggle with, this is the one that gets me, because I point out how everyone almost unanimously understood that that was an evil and a horrific event. And most cops that I know are at least open to the idea that policing needs to improve. We can always get better. Would you agree, Eric? Yes. We, we pretty much all agree on that. There's always room for improvement. But what bothers me personally in regard to that whole event was is the assumption that's often made that racism is involved. Like that's the go-to. Is it possible that Chauvin was just an idiot? I mean, listen, I'm being honest, and I'm not trying to cater to anybody, whatever the case may be. As a Christ follower in particular, my desire isn't to go with how I feel. That's not my main focus. My main focus is to try to honor the, the, the one who is the author of truth, wherever that may take us. And that may take us into places that we're not used to going. And I know as a black man, born and raised in the United States, I know that there's some, certain, there are, there's some scars in our country, and they're hard to overcome. And some of these things, and, often, and, and then if you add to the fact that sometimes you have a media who wants to poke and pry at that, to make it even worse, to keep us angry. And I think there are a lot of reasons why, and I can go on and on about that. I can do another 30 minutes talking about that topic. But I understand that there are a lot of issues there, and there are people there who, who, who use these, these scars, these wounds, to keep us angry and keep us frustrated. But I, I, I would like to question and challenge everyone out there that we need to be, we need to dig deeper. It's easy and simple, and often to, to assume race is the motive. It's an easy way out, in my opinion. Let's dig deeper and find out the truth. Now, if more details and more information comes out, and we find out that Chauvin was a racist and there's documented proof, then let's consider that. But until we, but every, just because a black person is been, has been victimized by someone who's white, it, we should not just assume that racism is the primary motiv motivation. But that's all you hear. That's all you hear these days. Turn on the news. That's all you hear. Racism, racism, racism. I'm tired. Personally, I'm tired of hearing that. I'm just saying, I'm frustrated with that. Because I understand that sin lies in the heart of every man as a Christian, and that we all wrestle with things, but not everyone one wrestles with the same sin. So. Thank you. We, we have a few questions coming in through the text. Um, one of them you answered already relates to the training that police officers go through, and you, you just answered that in the previous comments that there's always room for improvement. Always. Um, the, the, another question is, is uh, what, do we, what do we say to somebody who, and I'm not sure where the questioner is coming with this, but 
What do you say if you're engaging someone and they they are are doubting that the numbers are legitimate? <laughs> I mean, I, I, no, I get that often. Do you? Okay, so yeah, how, how do you handle that when somebody challenges your your research or the statistics that, that you give? Then I would oftentimes ask them what the burden of proof is on them to prove up, prove otherwise. Because when it's all said and done, everyone takes someone's information. Whether it's anecdotal evidence, as in, Kevin, you tell me about something that took place to you. We all listen to something. So primarily those people who are out there who are assuming that the numbers are questionable or false. And if you notice, a lot of the data sources I gave were from various sources. Center for Disease Control, the uh, FBI Uniform Crime Report, the Washington Post. I picked tons of sources that weren't conservative or right-leaning, whatever the case may be, the, like I said, CDC, various sources, various studies, because I'm trying to give an even-keeled approach to it. Even the Washington Post, a, a liberal-leaning, left-leaning organization, I'm not trying to make it political, but we all know in a reality that we're living in, there is a discussion and a debate, conservative and liberal. It, it's, part, we, it's, it's right before us all the time. And there are opinions that come from people who lean more left, as there are people who lean more right. So my, what I would always ask them to do is, what information do you have that counteracts that? And, and just ask them to be truthful and examine the information. But when you're dealing with information that comes from a variety of sources, people from various backgrounds and viewpoints, it's hard to really overcome that information. And that's why I made the slide like I did the whole presentation the way that I did. So I would suggest that whoever is willing to give some information would just be, just give a little more, uh, make sure their, their information, their data is from a wide variety of it's, sources. It sounds like the questioner has encountered people that dispute statistics. I'm sure everyone yeah. in there probably yeah. has. So, so um, it, it, could, could you speak a little bit to the reaction that has occurred uh, after the fact, uh, really after the, the George Floyd incident with the riots, the protests, um, the, the entire movement behind that. Could, could you speak a few minutes to that, please? Yeah. Just your thoughts on it? And yeah, my thoughts are, and I kind of touched on it a little bit when I talked about how overall people were open and willing, and most people said, yeah, there are problems here. These things, there's some issues here that def definitely need to be addressed, and we're open to that. And that was a perfect opportunity for unity, and it was universally had. But then you had other people who came in, agitators, so I think protests are a beautiful thing, and it's a blessing and gift that we're allowed as American citizens. But then you have people who came in who were seeking to agitate and cause conflict and cause chaos. And this whole movement of defunding and abolishing the police, I think is absolutely insane. And we're seeing what happens as a result of that. All you have to do is look at, what's it called, CHOP now, or Chaz? the amount of chaos that takes place. The people, for anyone who may not know, when they have that, that what do they call it? That? Well, that's one thing they say, that opportunity zone or? Yes. Autonomous. autonomous zone, yes. Uh, they call it uh, autonomous zone in Washington, in Seattle. And you see all the chaos that's going, that's taking place up there. These people have this ideology that abolish and defund the police and no police are allowed but you're, you're already having killings, you're having sexual assaults, you're having all kinds of crime going on in there. And uh, what was the question again? Because I want to, there's a just, just your general, your, just a question related to your general you know, thoughts on, on, on the, uh, uh, the riots, right. on, you know, your answer. And, and even maybe if you want to share some thoughts in general on the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, well, let me touch on this topic first here is uh, the fact that when we, when we, when we looked already, we see problems in the policing, police community. We see issues, areas of improvement, major problems, some more significant than others, training issues. As a police trainer, someone who's actually had cops, took them to the range, taught them DTs, I can tell you that there are, there are times where you have cops that are complacent, that don't really care about training because they see it as an inconvenience. That's a real, that's a real issue. I, it used to frustrate me to no end, there are officers out there who don't care about improving, and my frustration would come off the time from, my man, you carry a gun on you 40 hours a week, and you wear body armor when you come to your job. 
Who does that? What percentage of the population does that for a living? So you better consider your physical fitness, you better consider your tools, and you can't just be a baton and a gun. You have to have more. You have to be able to go hands-on. Coming from my background, my corrections background, I was always a guy that liked to go hands-on first. If things escalate, I'd rather use an appropriate amount of force or the minimal force necessary to take it under control. Now, there were times where I had to go draw down on someone. By the grace of God, I never had to shoot anyone, had to kill anybody. Thank, thank the Lord for that. But there, I, I, I didn't understand that there, come a time, that there might come a time where I had to go there. But if I didn't, I wanted to make sure that my skill set was broad enough to where, it, and if it wasn't a physical thing, where I, and I, nothing gave me more pleasure than being able to talk a tense situation down. Nothing. Another question that, that came in. Uh, actually, I think it's a comment. There's a um, just mentioning a book by Heather McDonald on police officers. Lots of facts, statistics that tend to also dispute some of the mainstream media reporting. Yeah, the book's titled "The War on oh, the War on Cops." Excellent, excellent resource, and it just offers an example because. She, she gathers a ton of information and data from various sources. She actually went out into these communi uh, communities and had conversations and discussions with different people in order to get a, a better understanding. And it just counteracts a lot of the mainstream narrative that we're getting. So once again, uh, it's Heather McDonald and the book's title is? The War on Cops. The War on Cops, okay, thank you. Um, Follow-up question. Um, could you speak to any impact of, uh, any, any correlation of a lack of a father figure with uh, prison inmates in general? Well, I don't have any exact numbers and stats and figures, but it's pretty much common knowledge. Even Barack Obama, during one of his speeches, spoke on how there, there was a greater likelihood for a, a, a young man or even young woman, for a young woman, she has a greater likelihood of becoming pregnant without the father in the home. And people have a greater, young people have a greater likelihood of dropping out of school, greater likelihood of suffering from mental health disease, be, becoming hooked on some kind of drug or alcohol, and a much greater likelihood to end up in prison when the father isn't in the home. And you asked me to reference Black Lives Matter, and that's one of the many issues as a Christian where I, would, where I struggle to say that I would, I can rock with those guys if I can just use some, just talk plainly to you, because part of their primary motivation is the dismantling of the quote-unquote nuclear family. And you're talking about a father, and you can go and don't believe me, just go on the website, look it up for yourself. And if in one of the main areas that blacks are negatively influenced the most, when you look at the single-parent home rate in the in the area of 70 percent. So you mean to tell me, and then we, and then, I always say that in order for us to get a better understanding of these issues, and it steps on a lot of toes and makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but I, I just want to be real, and I want to really address these issues fairly and wholly, we have to be willing to acknowledge, and I kind of touched on it during the presentation, but we have to be willing to acknowledge the inordinate amount of crime in certain aspects of different communities. And I want to speak on the black community in particular. I was, I'm a black man, as everyone can plainly see, and I worked in the prison system, the county jail, patrolled the streets, and, uh, and this isn't a wholesale paint a broad brush over anybody, but there is a small segment of less than 6%, and particularly black men, there's a small segment who are responsible for an overwhelming amount of crime in certain areas, over 50% of the homicides. And this is not just one year, this is consistently. Over 50% of the robberies and approximately 40% of the violent crime in the nation. And if we want to have a fair discussion, now poverty, all these other fact, other, uh, fathers' homes, all these other things play a role. But in order to have a fair and balanced approach in this discussion, in this debate, we have to be willing to look at every aspect, every part of what's going on, going on in the culture in order to say, how do we fix this thing? And if all you want to do is just say, well, just get the government, to get them to give people more money, that's just not being realistic. There have been over $20 trillion that has been pumped into 
poverty program since the 1960s, $20 trillion. And we see things are only getting progressively worse.